All right, well, good morning, everyone. Let's begin this worship service. Please let the Holy Spirit fill you and, and center you in an attitude of uh, prayer and, uh, and of uh, fellowship with your fellow Christians. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His Lord. Communion every week for those of us who are here. I hope you picked up a communion packet. 
on your way in. And uh, for those who are, are at home and who want to join in communion with us, I hope that you have your, your elements ready as well. Uh, and uh, let's see. Oh, today is Ascension Sunday. So we're celebrating Ascension Sunday. It's the end of Easter tide, right? The end of the Easter season. Next week is Pentecost. We've got some wonderful things coming up next week. And so uh, let's begin, though, with an opening prayer. I invite Patterson now to offer an opening prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you today humbled and, and just grateful to be in your presence, Lord. I pray in this worship service you can open our hearts and minds to you, Lord, so that we can get a closer relationship to you. We ask all of this in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. We have a children's message. Patterson is going to offer the children's message today. From the words of someone much better than I. <laughs> um, and it goes, if you would give it from me. So kindly. Of um, <laughs> this past week at youth, we talked about how God loves us as is. Remember the other day when you thought something, when you thought something mean to yourself? God still loves you. Remember when you forgot to do something your parents asked? God still loves you. Remember, remember that choice you made that probably wasn't a good decision, but you chose to do it anyway. Well, God still loves you. And God loves us, as is, in all of our sin and all of our brokenness. God loves us because we are his children and we are still precious to him. Remember to thank God for his mercy when we make mistakes, but also remember to thank God for his unending love. Thank you to who? you, and thank you to whoever thought of all that. <laughs> <laughs>
to invite Miss Iris to come forward, share her thoughts with us today. You remember a few weeks ago, I recommended that you all get an upper room and read it. Last Thursday, I loved the message, and I thought maybe we'd talk a little bit about it this morning. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in the triumphal procession, and through us spreads every place the fragrance that comes from knowing Him. And it talked about a professor who stood in front of the class, and I was going to do that, and then I thought we'd all have masks on. <laughs> and he sprayed air freshener into the room. And he said, raise your hand when you smell it. And as it traveled through the room, you could see the kids in the front first, and then as it spread to the back, they all raised their hands. Um, that's what we are to do with the fragrance that comes from knowing Jesus. We're to go out into the world and spread that fragrance around. How many of you have been in a room, someone walks in, and immediately it's like a breath of fresh air. You just know there's something special about them. And it comes from knowing Christ, from having that fragrance within us, and then spreading it into the world. And the way we do that is we serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. You offer a word of encouragement. You provide a listening ear. Spend time with someone in need of support. And don't forget to listen. Today, let us look at ways to be the fragrance of Christ in a world that needs to know and experience God's love. Great. Thank you so much. We're going to turn to Scripture right now. And if you have a Bible with you, or if you have a Bible on your phone, on your uh, device, I invite you to open your book or device to uh, the book of John. We are looking into chapter 17. We're going to be starting at verse 6. And if you have uh, a red letter Bible, uh, when you see the red letters, you know that those are the words of Jesus. Now this, this one that we're about to read is not just Jesus talking, okay? This is a prayer that Jesus prays over his disciples, but he's praying aloud, and they're there. So they are hearing Jesus' thoughts, Jesus' prayers for them. I'm going to start at 6, I'm going to go through 12. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me. Of course, he's talking to God here. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them, and I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name and the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except for the one doomed to destruction, so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. That's God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. Before I begin the message, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Please be in prayer with me. Gracious Lord, I come before you again with the great privilege and responsibility of bringing the word to your beloved people. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart are pleasing in your sight, for you alone are my rock and my redeemer. So in the 
Today's prayer that we just heard today, hopefully you read along, Jesus prays for his disciples and for us by extension. In this prayer, we have the great privilege of taking a peek into Jesus' heart. These are the uppermost thoughts in his mind as he prepares to ascend into heaven, leaving his beloved disciples here on earth. So these are not merely his last words, but they are his last prayer. Again, we're reminded of how much God loves us all. And here we are the undeserving recipients of his great love. Jesus prays for all of those whom the Father has given eternal life. And his hope, Jesus' hope in this, in this prayer is to encourage his original followers, to give them the confidence that they need as he prepares to leave them. Since we are also his followers, his words speak to us as well. Let us find encouragement today. Today is the day we commemorate Jesus' ascension into heaven. Today is the day that, that ends the season of Easter tide, and uh, now we're next week, of course, is Pentecost. We know that Jesus, at this point in the scripture, we know that he had been crucified. We know that he had been risen from the grave, and we know that he had visited his followers in various places and capacities. There was that, that impromptu uh, fish breakfast uh, on the shore. Uh, there was also the, those, those meetings that he had when they thought that they were locked away in the upper room, and they were terrified. So his post-Easter visits served to remind his people that he was alive. He is an Easter God, and we are Easter people. As Easter people, we too are to be encouraged. We are not to dwell in feelings of despair. Our role is to hope in the assurance of Jesus, of Jesus' presence in our life, of all that he has accomplished while he was here on earth and as he continues to work in our hearts and our lives today. One of the major themes in this passage is that of generous giving. God and Jesus are extravagant givers. They have given us grace. We who belong to Jesus live in that grace. It is in that grace that we have our breath and our movement in him. And if you'll notice that there's a great deal of, of circularity within the scripture today. It's I, me, you, us, we, and, and just, just around and around and around. And, and God and Jesus are one and the same, right? Their mutual giving demonstrates the oneness between them. As the Father does, so does the Son. As the Father is a giver, so is the Son. The Son imitates the Father. In his prayer, we see that Jesus is speaking to the ones that God gave him. He said, his, his words were, those whom you gave me from the world, right? So God gave us to Jesus. He goes on to say to God, they were yours and you gave them to me, right? So our reality, our destiny is to be one of Jesus' belongings. We are his. Now the next thing that we're given here is the knowledge of of God's name. It's not enough to know that we belong to God. We've been given brains, we've been given a spirit, and it's important for us to know him and to know in turn that we can call on the name of God. And, and I don't mean just to know the name like you would an acquaintance. It's not that. But to know with all of our being, all of our heart, everything that we have, that he is the source of all of our blessings. God's name is not just his identity, but it speaks of his character. It speaks of power, right? We know that he had the power to resurrect Jesus from the grave. Knowing his name for us means that we are sustained and protected by the power of his name. Yeah, God is a giver, right? And that he has given us the word. 
Now when I say God gave us the word, some of you may think immediately of the Holy Bible, and you'd be absolutely correct in that. It is, this is the word. There is more to the word than just the printed word, however. And that's what I'm going to talk about here. And it, it, it gets a little theologically thick, so I, I hope I am clear with this. If you were to look into uh, your Bible or on your device into uh, the Gospel of John, the first chapter, the first verse, you would see something like this. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Very important theological information here. And you will notice, if, if you look at it, if you can here or when you get home perhaps, you'll notice that every time the word is mentioned, it is capitalized. Well, that brings on a, a, at least two other theological meanings which we are going to unpack today. You'll see that the, the W in the word is capitalized. The capitalization and the word itself each carry its own meaning. The meaning of word in this case refers to divine reason. Divine reason. Divine wisdom. God gives us divine reason. The ability to be aware of his presence and the willingness to connect to him. Those are gifts from God. If it were not for both Jesus and this divine reason, we would be entirely lost in this broken world. God has given us the gift of Jesus and the awareness of his presence. So here's how this plays out. God has given us to his son, Jesus. Jesus has given us the word or the divine reason that was given to him by God. He's given us the ability to believe and to accept Jesus into our heart. Furthermore, we know from Paul's writings that no one, nothing can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So that's, that's how that all wraps in together. In Jesus' prayer, he makes this statement, all who are mine are yours and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Because of God's love and his gift of Jesus, the community of believers, that is us, right? That is, that is us and, and those who are at home as well. We are a community of believers, and as such, we glorify God. <coughs> Just let that sink in for a second. We glorify God. Wow, that is a powerful statement. It makes me pause, and it makes me look into those dark, murky corners of my life. We all have them. Those, those little corners that I prefer people not know about, right? We all have them. We all have those corners of sin and error. And error. God knows all about those. We, we think maybe we're hiding them from him, but we're not, right? And even in spite of those dark and murky corners in our lives and in our hearts, we are God's glory. That just, it just absolutely blows me away. Clearly, our God is able to look beyond our faults and our failings. He forgives us, and then he calls us his glory. I don't know about you, but I, I, I want to live up to that. I want to live up to that. This prayer that Jesus speaks, it has a purpose. Jesus is not only saying goodbye to his disciples, but he's sending them into the world. The world into which he is dispatching them is violent and corrupt. It's a dangerous place. We didn't just create violence and corruption in the last 75 years here. No, no, that's, that's, been, that's been going on forever. And then he sends them forth to spread the gospel and to demonstrate the love of God. Despite the risk and because of the Father's love, this community of disciples are sent into the world just as the Father's love has been sent into the world. Let's remember that the world is made up of both people who reject God and those who belong to him. But let us remember that the entire world, the entire world, is the object of God's powerful love. We have the Holy Bible, which is the word of God. 
we have Jesus, the capital W Word of God, and we have this great sense of His presence. We have this divine reason, divine wisdom. God, indeed, is a generous giver. He's given us everything we need to be His disciples. So what are you doing with the discipleship gifts that God has given us? Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you have been such an extravagant and generous giver, giving us everything we need to help serve and love this world, to love it beyond its pain and sorrow and corruption and, and all of that, Lord. Give us the strength and the wisdom to go forward. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we all know, I just talked about how what everything that God has given to us, we know that giving is, is a part of our worship as well. And uh, so if, if you uh, have placed your gift into the plate uh, down the center aisle there, we thank you for that. If you haven't done that yet, we ask you to do that on your way out. And for those of our friends who are uh, watching online, we ask that uh, if you have a gift for us, that you send it our way. Um, either uh, you can do that online, you can uh, do that uh, in person, or you can drop it in the mail as well. And I'd like to say a prayer over the gifts that are coming our way. <clears throat> Jesus, we pray that we might see a glimpse of your heavenly kingdom right here. We pray that our gifts will be used for compassion, for justice, and reconciliation. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our communion meditation today, we're, we're about ready to take communion. Um, and for those of us who are here, I think we know how to navigate our little communion packs. Uh, for those who are watching from home, I invite you to make sure you've got your uh, communion elements uh, available. The communion meditation is something, well, I, I wrote this one. Um, it's about teaching moments. I raised my children, as you know, Joe and I have two children, and, and, and I raised my children looking for those teaching moments. Sometimes the teaching moments were as a result of a mistake that I had made. And maybe I spoke to them too harshly, or maybe I made some other mistake. And, and to, to teach them something about, about you know, humility, and yeah, mom, mom makes mistakes too. Sometimes uh, the uh, teaching moment surrounded something that, uh, that they had done wrong. And so rather than just uh, condemn them for that, it, it was, you know, this is, this is where you made the misstep, and this is how we can make it right again. No incident was too small or too insignificant to inspire a lesson. The lessons were intentional ways of teaching my kids about life. In those moments, it was my dearest hope that my children would remember the teaching moments. Sometimes I've checked in with them on some of those teaching moments, and some of them they didn't remember. Um, but anyway, but it was my prayer that they would remember them so that they could use them later on. It, I, I like to think that Jesus believed in teaching moments as well. He never missed an opportunity to offer a teaching to his people. We know that when he broke the bread, when he poured the juice, when he gave that to his disciples, that was a teaching moment for the disciples. Jesus was teaching them about the depth of his love for them when he told them that the bread was his body and the wine or the juice was his blood. He used simple elements in a familiar setting to describe the sacrificial love he had for each of them. His teaching moments remind us all that Jesus died for us. The body and blood of Christ for each and all. Amen.
Thanks be to God for his teaching moments. As he draws us close to him and offers himself to us. Amen. Let's join now in the Lord's Prayer, the one that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now offer our benediction, and it should be on our slides here. Let us pray this together as we prepare to leave this this holy place. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage and hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people because all people are God's people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may God bless you. Let's now enjoy our closing song.